collecting is a creative process, which I enjoy very much. And putting things together in unusual and surprising ways with discoveries is my satisfaction, as opposed to strictly looking at it as a financial derivative and place to park money and way to beat inflation or what have you, which by the way, is perfectly good too. <laughs>
Um, I felt the sale really needed it. And so, you know, to have these greats that I've admired uh, and loved for so many years, from Hearst to Murakami to Coons to Urs Fischer to my Wade Guyton to, you know, Richard Prince, who I admire and someone who I, has really been inspirational to me and very helpful to me, I needed to put that fly in the ointment. I needed to mix it up. I needed to part with my Etel Adnan, which I'm crazy about, but I needed to put in, you know, the Lynn Fawkes that is so different. And in the end, I think that it also is good in the sense that to the extent that this sale will reach an audience, people will learn about these artists, see these artists, and see them in a different context. Let me ask you about the strategies around the sale. Some of the estimates seem pretty low to me. Do you have an auction house strategy that you tend to go with like, well, I'll high estimate because I don't want to sell it for less than that or the way to get to the big price is to go low. What's your general philosophy for yourself? So I have a different view of auctions than perhaps many. Uh, my feeling was if I'm doing this, it's all the way. We're going to put I'm going to have to put great things, dig deep, part with some things that hurt, uh, and put estimates that are basically, in my view, half or less than half of what the real value well, is. Well, they're, they're the same when you add the buyer's premium, which is what, 150% or something. <laughs> so when you see the estimate and you add 26 or 27%, you're closer to like retail at that point, aren't you? No, 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 no. These estimates are less than half. I mean, I, I, just to pick out a lot of the Etel Adnan, I mean, I've, I've had offers of five times the estimate. Um, the major things are worth between 50 and 100% of what the estimates are. The estimates to me, I just live in a world, uh, and perhaps I'm in a bubble, Josh, where people know what things are worth, and so it's nice to have a high estimate, but like, I don't, want, I don't want that. I want an exciting sale. And I think that because it's 39 lots, um, it will work out. I, but I, when you've been buying at auction, have you found yourself attracted to, hey, that's an estimate, that's an exciting price, and that sometimes you bid or spend more than you would have if it had had the high estimate to begin with? No doubt you're right. And also, remember, this is a single owner sale mid-season. So how do you get people excited? It's not May and you know, so it, it's like I needed to leave a lot of meat on the bone. I needed to leave plenty so that there's like, wow, I could buy this for this and create excitement and energy. I think it's good for the storytelling. And by the way, if it sells poorly, it's my risk. But I think that risk is needed to be taken. Let me ask you about a marketing question that we were all kind of um, impressed with, if not stunned, of being in freeze just recently. Every time you call an Uber, there'd be Adam Lindemann's Warhol electric chair like up on the screen. Who, whose idea was that? How much did that cost? Uh, how much did that cost me? <laughs> you know, uh, that was so embarrassing. I, I, when I first heard the idea, once again, I was like, wow, I'm sitting at the Freeze LA Art Fair, and everyone who goes to the art fair is going to see an ad for me. People were coming over congratulating me. Like but did I was, everybody in LA, every time they were taking an Uber, see that, or was somehow? I have to give Christie's credit. It was their marketing, and it's a bit embarrassing, but you know what? I think it's great, and this sale has been trying to take a recipe which has existed for decades and centuries perhaps and come up with a few changes that make it fun, that make it exciting. And I think as we get closer to the sale, you will see, the audience will see that both the installation, the way it's presented, the publication that's coming out, everything is trying to be a little bit different. And I believe that, and I know that the quality of each one of the works is pretty unimpeachable. Now, it's a two-part question. Had you taken all this material and put it up in your gallery or the big expanded 
Levy, Gorby Gallery that's in the opening soon that could hold this. If you'd put it up in LGDR, yes. you'd have a different kind of feeling to try to sell all these privately versus at, a, at auction. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of feel about that? And part two is I've noticed, like we talked about this being a believer that Warhol's undervalued and electric chairs are undervalued. And having seen that painting at an art fair will suddenly perform better in this context at auction or with the other bells and whistles around it? Well, first of all, in my own gallery, I almost never show my own things, uh, generally speaking. Uh, of course, I do on occasion have some things I own, and I always acquire my own artists, so, but I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I would never put my personal collection in my gallery. Or in uh, somebody else's gallery, though. Yeah, George Kondo actually said that to me. He's like, are you gonna put your own things in your gallery? I'm like, George, do you know me? Come on. Um, now, would I put it in another gallery? I have on occasion, but, it doesn't tell my story. So here I have the luxury of telling my story, not just looking at it as a financial tool and putting it in someone's gallery and trying to get it, money out of it, which is nice. Here I'm actually telling a story, which is kind of interesting for me because that's what I love about art. But and do you think buyers like the story? And that's what's so. gonna get them to maybe reach deeper than if it was just a singular object at Gagosian Gallery or or where have you, where it's focused on the objectness. It's a great question. Rather than the story. It's a great question. Listen, I don't know if they're gonna reach deeper, but hopefully the story will get them to pay attention. Um, you know, my daughters, I said to my daughters, like, wow, we're gonna make a lot of noise here. And she's like, well, you're doing a mid-season sale. You're gonna to have to. Um, so there is, had to be a story. There had to be a narrative. Um, it couldn't be in a gallery. It had to be at auction and it had to like, tell a tale of you know what is Adam and how do these things fit together and what would be the aesthetic of the person that would put this together and how does this inform Damien Hirst or Jeff Koons to mix it with a totem from Vanuatu or to put it with a balloon from Andra Ursuta who's an artist that I've loved from early on in her career but how does that affect a Warhol electric chair? How long did it take you as a collector to realize great collections tell a narrative. Whereas that 10 or 20 years in, you realized these are the stories I'm actually telling. How long it took you to understand that collections tell a story? Yeah. Well, um, that's a really good question because to me, uh, a collection tells a story. But um, I don't think that the art market, generally speaking, and that many collectors, need their art to tell a story. A lot of people are buying art because they want to have a great eye, they want to know what's great, they want to be in early, or they want to be at a good price, or they want to have something that's worth more. That The idea of collecting telling a story is perhaps a little more European or a little more personal, but to me, as a collector, um, collecting is a creative process, which I enjoy very much. And putting things together in unusual and surprising ways with discoveries is my satisfaction of enjoying the creative process of collecting, as opposed to strictly looking at it as a financial derivative and place to park money and way to beat inflation or what have you, which by the way, is perfectly good too. <laughs> Some people might think of you as a flipper, in fact, there's very few flips in this. First of all, what do you think of flippers? Are you in this? Well, that's a great question, Josh. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm always, uh, well, not always, but very much against buying young artists at galleries, including my own, and putting them at auction. Uh, it happens all the time. It's not my habit to do so, and it never has been. Uh, on occasion, famous occasions, I have bought something primary for seven figures, over seven figures, and sold them for eight. Um, at some point in time, you know, financial uh, realities come into play. However, uh, I really uh, don't believe in that, uh, don't agree with that. Uh, there's exceptions to every rule. I've had very, very few. Um, in this sale, 
very deliberately uh, absolutely everything except for one or two things uh, have been acquired at auction or on the secondary market. So there's no primary material here. There's nothing that came from any gallery. If you look at the provenance, you see I bought it at auction and you can research and see how much I paid for it and you'll see that you know the estimates are quite reasonable. Now, in the unusual instance where there is perhaps one, uh, um, this is a friend of mine and I believe that I'm doing uh, a service by creating awareness um, and uh, mixing a younger artist with Warhol and Calder. Which and artist? I have a painting that I love by my friend Jamie and Giuliani Villani. And I am a fan of hers and I consider myself a friend. Uh, and I asked her up front that, uh, you know, uh, this would uh, go in an auction because I thought it was important and I thought it fit the theme and I thought it told the story. And, uh, you know, every artist is initially very worried because they're told it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. But in fact, um, you know, whatever. There's well, a lot I mean, of love there. Self-portrait kind of one from that artist. So you'll be able to help my clients get one maybe. You have a self-portrait? No, we, we want one. Oh. So you'll make a call for us, right? <laughs> But generally speaking, it's true what you said. Everything was coming from auction or from galleries. The historic materials, you know, was I bought from dealers. And uh, look, the Coons I bought at Sotheby's, uh, famously uh, for me. The Damien Hearst is from the pharmacy sale. There were only three cabinets in the pharmacy sale in 2002. One of them went to a French collector, one of them went to me, the other one Damien owns. I mean, that's the end of the story. The Murakami, uh, which was in the Qatar show, it was in the amazing Brooklyn show, it's in every early important Murakami show and book. I bought that at Sotheby's. Um, the Wade Guyton I bought privately. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, there are some exceptions. The Urs Fischer, uh, is, is, is something that I felt uh, the sale would tremendously benefit from. And it's a dramatic, amazing outdoor installation. Uh, so there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, I think that they, the whole package works. And you want a good sale. Like you want a mix that works. I didn't want to throw in things that, uh, that I have didn't two work. final questions. One is, Will there be an announcement that parties with interested relationships to the seller may be bidding? Like, is your wife going to be bidding? Are you going to bid on your own stuff? Your kids? Uh. <laughs> your brother? You I buy, should. Could you buy? Are you thinking about bidding on any of your own things? I should. I should buy them back. Um, no, uh, that's, that's not part of the game. That, that's the, I, th I think when you do something like this, it's funny to go back to the beginning. You said, this is what you do when you're dead. Um, so, uh, but I did see Jacques Grange did it and you know, Peter did one in a different way. Uh, I often thought about the Yves Saint Laurent sale. Uh, I'm f of course far from that, but it's funny to look at these things that you've owned for decades and loved and the moment of parting with them is a kind of a end of a story. When I first saw the news about it, what jumped out to me was the charitable aspect to it. I heard that a million dollars is going to Avenues for Justice. Thank you, Adam. But tell us, as a famous philanthropist, what was going on with the charity? Who else is also benefiting from this? Well, I think we, the privileged, never give enough uh, in general. And I'm as guilty of that as anyone. However, I've been a fan of the Metropolitan Museum since as a child I grew up in the neighborhood and used to throw frisbees back and forth across the fountains. Um, and I'm a huge fan of mixing the old and the new. And that's part of my collection is mixing the old and the new. So um, uh, I've been a, a real collector and an aficionado of African, oceanic and art of the Americas pre-Columbian particularly. I was a Mayan nut and Aztec and love Africa and everything to do with African art and 
and the Pacific, and, and now I've been focused on Oceania for the last couple of years. But uh, I've been on the steering committee of the Rockefeller Wing, which is where all the oceanic and African art is for many years. And I've now been the head of the committee for about two years. So I thought that part of this sale should benefit uh, an interest of mine personally. So we've only put in one Vanuatu totem. That's just a symbol. It's not a, a part of like the bigger picture. It's just one thing there to remind people how exciting the Rockefeller wing is. And I think that uh, Elisa Lagama, my friend, who was the director of the wing, put in a few words in the auction catalog and in the sale. And Max Holine, our new director, relatively new director, I'm a huge fan of what he's doing. And so I thought that the sale should uh, have some philanthropic angle. And so uh, I'm making a gift out of the proceeds to help finish the Rockefeller wing, which will be done in two years, and which will be amazing because it's part of making New York, they're very smart about this. They're continuing to think of New York as the capital of the world. And if New York is the capital of the world, as a New Yorker, I certainly hope it is, it's important to have work from Africa from pre-Columbian sites, from Peru, from Vanuatu, or from Papua New Guinea. I mean, all these people, when they come to New York, they find something that's their own. And so I think it's just a great thing to do. And part of this multicultural, open-minded way, I like to think about art. The Bear Facts would like to thank you, Adam, for letting us into your home, giving us insight into how you collect. Next week, March 9th, the sale, see the results, you'll either be proven perfectly genius or you'll say, what did I do? <laughs> Which is it going to be, Adam? Thank you. <laughs> we shall soon know. But Josh, always a pleasure and I'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks.